Uh, this is lecture number 42 in the series of the ABCs of Communism based on chapter 59 in uh, next year's ABCs of Communism Bolshevism 2017, which is what it will be when it appears. Now, I uh, this is part of this series called The Empire Strikes Back, this time against Peru. And we've been running through uh, several of those countries um, where the U.S. has launched a counter-revolution. And, of course, we're becoming increasingly aware of that because of what's been going on in Venezuela and Bolivia. But Peru has a special interest to me. Those of you who read the previous chapters know that I've had considerable experience in that country. And naturally, I have maintained some contacts there over the years since I escaped captivity there in 1980. Of particular interest has been the emergence of Ollanta Humala on the Peruvian scene in the last few years. Uh, he's been president for five years, finishing up his term now. Just to recap for a moment, you may recall that in 1977 I went to Peru for Richard S. Scotty McNeish to take over his Ayacucho Valley archaeological project. Now, in addition, in 1977, some of you may know from reading my uh, autobiography, I went to Peru to give a hand to the rebel army of the PCP-SLCM. Those are the Spanish initials for Communist Party of Peru, Shining Path of Carlos Mariátegui. And I'll just do this in English because I know all, everybody watching this series is going to be speaking English for the most part. Now, part of that work at the time consisted in training PCP fighters in basic small unit tactics in guerrilla warfare, and part of it assisted, uh, consisted of assisting Abubayo Guzman in achieving financialization of his movement. Now, at that time they had money, but they did not know how to use it. And actually, they could have had a lot more money um, if they had been aware of how to do it, and I kind of gave him some assistance in both of those cases, um, since I happened to know a young man who was flying uh, into Peru, on a re or wanted to be at least, flying to Peru on a regular basis, so he could um, pick up shipments of cocaine, a young fellow named, uh, well, it doesn't really matter right now, but it's in the book if you're interested. The important thing is I was able to give them assistance. Now, I, there's two things here that were important to me at the time. Not only was it giving them some assistance, but I needed some cover. Now, in a situation like this, you can imagine that a gringo stands out in the highlands of Peru, kind of like an elephant in the room, and there's nothing, not much you can do about that, and not for very long anyway. So. I knew that arrest was a likelihood and that the cops would definitely kill me if I was political, meaning communist, uh, but that they would help me, on the other hand, if they thought I was a financier for traffickers. So I had two uh, things to accomplish there, and I think I did, otherwise I wouldn't be talking to you today. I did eventually get captured, I did spend nearly three years in prison down there in Peru, and uh, fortunately that uh, cover <laughs> lasted. Um, of course, I had to keep doing some work along those lines while I was inside. If you're interested in all that, you can read books four and five of my autobiography. At any rate, that's not the point of what we're doing here. Um, now, <coughs> those of you that might be interested in how I applied what I like to think of as my second PhD at the uh, that I, I like to think that I got from my time in that Peruvian prison, can read book number six in that series called Third Crusade. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more about that for the moment than that. Now, as the years passed, the struggle for freedom in Peru passed through several stages, occasionally requiring my return to the Leticia Trapezium of Colombia. And I'll talk about that kind of as we go along. Now that, if you look at your map of South America, you'll see that there is a, a trapezium-shaped projection of the Colombian nation that goes down to the Amazon River. 
So if you were to fly to the town of Leticia, for example, you uh, could then enter Peru by crossing the river. Not an easy task when it's full of crocodiles, I can tell you that. So, but that's another story. Or you could enter Brazil, and if you go at night, there aren't any customs guards there, so you can go right across into Tabatinga, Brazil. These are little pointers for those of you that might want to think about getting around without attracting a great deal of attention. Now, Ollanta Omala was elected in 2010 as Peru's president, and this presidency has gone through several phases. First were the initial months when he appeared to be implementing the left reforms he had campaigned on. The second saw the return of the, his return to a neoliberal path. And finally, Umala oversaw the emergence of the U.S. Death Star, that is the U.S. Embassy, as the de facto boss of Peruvian development, and ends with the final months of Humala, where he appears to have given up on any leadership role a la Obama in his final year. They just had elections in Peru, and the two neoliberal candidates, one called PPK, came in number one, and second to him was uh, Kiko Fujimori, who is the daughter of the former president Fujimori, who is now in prison for a variety of crimes. She's doing her very best to get her dad out, but the only decent candidate there was the uh, one who came in third, as we'll talk about her in a few minutes. And this has seemed to have kicked off a new left front alliance or reemergence of the old left front, which actually played an instrumental role in getting President Obama elected to begin with. Now, this Death Star that the U.S. built on at the edge of uh, Lima is uh, the de facto gringo vice royalty for Peruvian development. And in the last few months of the Umala regime, uh, there's a, it's, it's had an interesting role to play, which we're going to get to in a moment, minute. But what you'd want to remember is in the last few years, this embassy has become the center, the major center for CIA operations and NSA operations in all of South America. And they're busy, they've been busy trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, and uh, they have had some success in Argentina, as you may know, and managed to finally get somebody elected there as president, barely. And uh, they have had, they are trying to re hold on to their position in Colombia, but the Colombian ruling class has its own set of interests, kind of like the Mexicans. And um, the Mexican ruling class, and it's not as easy for the CIA to push people around with money because these guys have lots of money. Well, at any rate, we'll, we'll return to these topics as we go along. Now, Obama was a relatively young man, born in 1961, so he's about 20 years or 19 years older than me. He has been, I mean, younger than me. He's been president of Peru since 2011. Now, he was a former Army officer. He lost the 2006 presidential election, but won the 2011 presidential election in a runoff vote when he was running in the second round against Kiko Fujimori, the girl who's the daughter now running again and again in second place against the man they call PPK, who's in his 80s. So, at any rate, the son of Isaac Umala, that is, this Oyanti Umala, is the son of a man named Isaac Umala, so a rel relatively well-known labor lawyer in Peru. He's an ethnic Quechuan speaking indigenous lawyer, a member of the Communist Party of Peru, Red Fatherland, that's one of the earlier Communist parties, and ideological leader of the ethno casarista movement. Now, his son, Umala, entered the Peruvian Army in 1981. In the military, he achieved the rank of lieutenant colonel. And in 1991, he fought in the internal conflict against the Shining Path, Sendero Luminoso. And three years later, he participated in the Senepa War against Ecuador. In October 2000, Umala attempted an unsuccessful coup in Peru, uh, using soldiers in the southern city of Tacna against President Fujimori which failed, but he was pardoned by the Peruvian Congress 
after the downfall of the Fujimori regime. So in 2005, he founded the Peruvian Nationalist Party and registered to run in the 2006 presidential election. Now, the nomination was made under the Union for Peru ticket, as the Nationalist Party had not yet achieved its electoral inscription at that time. He passed the first round of the elections held on April 9, 2006, with 31 percent of the vote. A runoff was held in June 4th between Humala and Alan Garcia of the Aprista party. You know, Apri is the typical left faker, a second international kind of social democrat party. Umala lost this round with 47.5% of the ballot votes against Garcia's 53%. Now, after his defeat, Umala remained, however, as an important figure in Peruvian politics. You want to remember that he was the first one who had tried to overthrow Fujimori. He tried to do it with his troops. Failed. Then, he was pardoned by the Congress because all of a sudden, Fujimori was exposed for all kinds of corruption. Uh, he and his uh, security minister, a guy named Montesinos, who actually I knew when I was in prison down there uh, in Lurigancho, was a pretty fine fellow. He used to come out and visit us. But, you know, people change. At any rate, Oyanta Amala ran again, and this time he won. He was elected president of Peru in July of 2011 after campaigning on a platform of left-wing nationalism and rights for indigenous peoples. Remember that at least half of the country here is composed of people that don't even know how to speak Spanish. They are um, truly uh, natives, indigenous people, Indians, power, whatever you want to call them. And they have their own way of life. And because they, and the nature of Peruvian topography is such that the Spanish never conquered these people. You know, they, what they would do is they'd conquer a certain valley and then set up a slave labor system and forget about the others, and so people found they could find another valley. They could go here, they could go there. There was always some place they could go the Spaniards couldn't get to catch them. And the same thing was true uh, under the colonial regime. Now, uh, so he, at any rate, he finally uh, in 2011, in July of 2011, he beat Kiko Fujimori, who had a, a the majority of her boat, uh, boats had come from the Lima Callao area, and Umala had racked up votes in every other department. That's what they call a province, or like a state uh, of the country. So he managed to defeat her by uh, a series of particular moves, which aren't that important for our discussion. I don't want to get sidetracked. Now, during this campaign, Umala had opposed the controversial Conga project, C-O-N-G-A, uh, owned by Yanacocha, an open pit mine in the region of Cajamarca, which was a uh, front, the local, for the Newmont Corporation, headquartered in Denver, Colorado. Now, up to that point, it was the largest foreign investment project in Peruvian history. Soon, Chinese investment in Peruvian mining would swamp gringo imperialism as Peru's strongest trading partner and investor. This, so, this story gets very interesting and more complicated, as you're going to see in a few moments. Now, one indigenous woman took on the multinational mining corporation Newmont, Newmont uh, the Denver Corporation, and she won. She was an indigenous Peruvian farm worker, Maxima Acuna de Chaupe. She withstood violent eviction attempts, beatings, and a legal battle to protect her land from being turned into an open pit gold mine. This thing's at 4,000 meters. You're talking, you're, you're pushing the, the limits, but a white man can't work in these kind of mines, or a black man for that matter. Um, and at any rate, on February 19th of this year, Ms. De Chaupe finally saw victory when a Peruvian appeals court struck down the lawsuit levied by the Yanacocha mine, which is 51 percent owned by Colorado's Newpont Mining Corporation, that had sought to kick her out of the country. Now, the ruling is an important win in the case that has become a rallying point for local resistance to multinational plunder. But it's not quite as simple as it looks. Umala's enemies had propagandized that he was a socialist in the mold of Hugo Chavez and would surely wreck the Peruvian economy. Accordingly, the Peruvian stock 
Exchange took its greatest single day plunge in history, with the largest decline occurring in mining stocks the day after his election. However, in office, Omala proved to be his own man. Now, in this case, that was not what his supporters wanted. His enemies began to back off, and the Gringo Death Star began to plot anew to overthrow his government and put one more to their liking in power. Soon after his inauguration, Umala acted on his promises signing the Law of Prior Consultation, which requires companies to negotiate agreements with indigenous communities before building mines or oil wells on their land. Now, the new government sponsored several bills to raise taxes and royalties on mining companies and vowed to use the proceeds to build roads, schools, and public services in poor areas. Immediately, social unrest over the adverse effects of mining and energy development, overuse of scarce water supplies, environmental contamination, and the loss of land rights in the indigenous communities began to disappear because uh, they had gotten what they want. They, got, they had elected the president they wanted, and uh, he was one of them, and he was going to see to it that everything was right. Well, now, let's stop for a moment and let's talk about this decision that Ms. Acuna just won in the courts. Now, I can tell you that there isn't any judge in Peru that can't be bought and relatively cheaply because I've done a lot of it. And uh, so I've never heard of a judge in Peru that couldn't be bought, and I don't think there is such a thing. So the point is, why didn't Newmont buy the dis judicial decision that they wanted when they always, they always have before? They've never had any trouble doing it, and there was no reason to believe that this particular judge would be <laughs> likely to go straight. Now, if you ask that question, then you have to say, well, it must be that the CIA wanted Acuna to win that case. Now, why would they want to do that? Now, the CIA decided to give her a break, but the question is why? It's not because they're nice guys, because we know that's not the case. Often what the enemy doesn't tell you can be as important as what they do tell you. A case in point is that they won't tell you about. You can find out if you go to the website of what we used to call in my day the U.S. Army Language School in Carmel, California. Now, that has morphed into the Defense Intelligence Language School, which serves not just the Army, but all of the armed forces. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, and all of the 17 agencies, spy agencies, that the federal government maintains, plus quite a few from things like LAPD and, uh, you know, local cops that uh, have you know, big cities that need some kind of uh, assistance with regard to their Spanish-speaking especially elements. Now, in the case against Maxima Acuna, no judge, as I say, in Peru is very expensive to buy, as I know from personal experience. So if the CIA let this judge rule as he did, it also means they paid him to do so. And why? Well, the answer is this. The secret lie, uh, lies in understanding the language school in California that I was just mentioning to you. Now that language school has not only grown to a huge size in terms of what it services, but it also has branches all over the state. Now, the CIA has trained thousands of Quechua speaking agents in the last five years, and that's the key. Now, if you go to their website, as I did last night, just as a matter of interest, first thing they tell you is, uh, we want to track your, web, your computer, yes or no. Well, I, I checked it, yes, because they're, they're tracking it anyway. NSA tracks everybody's computer all the time. There's no such thing as an email that they don't have a copy of or a computer that they don't have complete access to. So, if you're going to use a computer to do any work in the United States, you want to be sure that you find somebody, other than yourself, to go to a uh, computer that's one-time use only in a library someplace and, uh, and use it and then get the hell out of there. But at any rate, the, uh, what are they doing with all these Quechua speaking? They've trained thousands of Quechua speaking agents during the course of the Umala administration. What are they doing with them? Well, one of the things that they're doing with them right now is they've sent them in 
to take advantage of this ruling that Ms. Acuna won, making, letting the left do what they like to do, which is make a big hero out of her, which she is. Nothing wrong with that. But the Chinese mining company, MMG, is running a huge open pit mine project in the Apurimac region, which also happens to be the uh, last stopping grounds for Sendero Luminoso, which now may make a comeback since where there's been a complete neoliberal coup, even against Humala, who's not anywhere near fascist enough for the CIA. <coughs> this is both a revenge for Newmont, and, and they have, by the way, decided to leave the country, so they said, fuck it, I'm, we're out of here. <laughs> Uh, more importantly, a test of how well their infiltration of Indian communities to the high Andes is working. Now, they plan on using them against all the progressive governments of South America with indigenous populations, which is to say almost every country of Latin America. Remember, the Andes extend all the way from Venezuela through Colombia, down through Ecuador, Peru, into Chile, and then eastwards into Bolivia and parts of what is now Paraguay and Brazil. So. There isn't any part of the, I mean, actually when you get to Argentina, there aren't very many Indians left there because the Spanish killed them all. Same thing pretty much true with Chile. But other than that, they, uh, they, there are Indian populations in almost every country of South America, and that's what they've been training these Quechua speaking agents to do. So, they won't have the trouble I had going in there because they don't look like white men or black men. They look like what they are. Uh, ethnically, they are Andean. And they have been taught, if they don't already know, how to speak various Quechuan languages. So there's a whole bunch of them. There's about 20 odd. At any rate, as I say, this is both revenge for Newmont and more importantly a test of how well their infiltration of Indian communities in the high Andes is working. And they plan on using these agents against all of these progressive governments of South America that have indigenous populations. Okay, returning to the election of Ubala back in 2011. Well, everything went well up until about October, in other words, a few months after his July election. And that was when he dismissed a woman named Raquel Aragonian. <coughs> president of the Institute for the Development of Indigenous Peoples in English. She opposed a concession made to Argentine gas company Plus Petrol, and after her dismissal, Plus Petrol moved forward with its plan for drilling. In November 2011, residents of Cajamarca and nearby Salindin, site of the Conga project, began holding rallies and marches to protest the expansion of the Conga project. Now that's the one that Newpont finally gave up on a few days ago. Now, in hopes of avoiding a mass strike, Prime Minister Salomon Lerner had met with the Regional Council in Cajamarca. You may remember Cajamarca <coughs> became famous in uh, Peruvian history. It's uh, far north of uh, the uh, of the Peruvian nation. And at any rate, we don't have to go back over that again. It's spelled C-A-J-A-M-A-R-C-A -A 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 in our English letters, Cajamarca. Uh, at any rate, the council led by Gregorio Santos unanimously passed an ordinance declaring the Conga project unsustainable. In addition, the headwaters, slated for destruction, now come under the regional protection. Umala declared a state of emergency, that is de facto martial law, in Cajamarca and three other provinces, thereby criminalizing protests and allowing arrests without warrants. As Yanacocha announced the suspension of the project, the military marched in and arrests began to take place. <coughs> Stunned by this turn of events, Prime Minister Lerner resigned in, 20, in December 2011. The entire cabinet stepped down as required by law. Over half the cabinet positions were replaced, including ministers of environment, culture, women, and social development. Referring to Congo Minister of Environment, Ricardo Giseke later stated, the people are completely justified. Even the centrist party, led by former President Alejandro Toledo, refused to continue in the government. Among those retained was Finance Minister 
Luis Miguel Castilla, a former World Bank official firmly committed to capitalist policy advantages. Now, in spite of the crackdown, protest a actions continued throughout the following year. Thousands of Cajamarcans and others around the country marched to the capital to demand new restrictions on mining. Now, these included a ban on the use of mercury and cyanide in mining, a ban on mining in headwaters, a constitutional right to drinking water, a moratorium on mining concessions, and the use or application of the law of prior consultation. In other words, like an early T-tip. Uh, it makes it illegal for a uh, government to uh, do anything to interfere with a private corporation regardless of what its laws may be. By July 2012, 250 protests regarding oil, water, and mining had been criminalized. A number of movement leaders were arrested and five lives were lost in clashes with the police. Humala portrayed movement activists as extremists who were standing in the way of the country's progress. The government desperately needed taxable revenue streams to finance Humala's grandiose plans. The president saw this revenue as coming as it always had for mining and was willing to make big concessions to foreign capital to get it. And the Chinese push into the South American movement, which was about to get underway, but at the cri this critic critical juncture, it was still not there and it was still high in the sky. We're talking about the end of uh, 2011. Okay, in May 2013, the law of prior consultation, which had not yet been applied, suffered a blow. An amendment to the law excluded Quechua-speaking people, the most numerous and widespread indigenous group in Peru, a bunch of groups as we've seen. In defense of the amendment, the Mola stated, in the highlands, the majority, the majority are agrarian communities, the product of the agrarian reform, <coughs> talking about former President Velasco that the CIA kidnapped, put into a naval hospital and then murdered. Overwhelmingly, the native communities are in the jungle. The amendment allowed a large number of new concessions to proceed and led to yet another resignation, that of Deputy Minister for Culture Ivan La Negra who had been in the midst of compiling the official database of indigenous people when he got the news that his services were no longer needed. Enter the Death Star. Ubala confronted a left opposition within his own government that resisted foreign investment concessions and would not implement his program. Thus the government divided and the U.S. Embassy took full advantage of the situation by making money available to the faction that they favored via the World Bank and IMF. On October 25, 2011, just two days before top indigenous rights official Raquel Erochin was sacked, the World Bank announced an agreement to extend a rather sizable $3 billion loan to Peru. And uh, that's, this is, of course, how they were operating. Times have changed just in the last few years because China is now Peru's number one trading partner, not Gringolandia. At any rate, where are they now? Many refugees of Umala's administration have since joined the movement for prior consultation and environmental re regulation. Raquel Arrojan, a former head of the Indigenous Peoples Institute, continues her work on behalf of indigenous community rights as a lawyer. Ricardo Giuseppe, former Minister of Environment, now works for the development of sustainable extractive industries. Jose de Acabe is dedicated to sustainable development and is often seen in social movement forums. Even La Negra, former Vice Minister for Intercultural Affairs, continues to speak out about the need for prior consultation for all indigenous communities. Former Prime Minister Solomon Lerner now works with Citizens for Change, a broad-based progressive party. <coughs> As he put it, <coughs> My job is to help form young leaders and word, work towards something we're losing, which is consensus in Peru. And finally, we come to Cajamarca's regional president, Gregorio Santos, who had opposed the Congo expansion. Santos was sentenced to 14 months in jail for alleged corruption. 
several weeks before the regional elections. He has since led a lively re-election campaign from jail using Facebook. Well, uh, anyway, I don't know how lively you can have as a campaign if you're, if you're in jail running on Facebook, but and anyhow, more on Umala's background and military career. Now, let's take a look at this again. As you've seen, he was born in Lima, Peru, about 20 years after me. He's the son of Isaac Umala. Ollanta's mother is Elena Tasso from an old Italian family established in Peru at the end of the 1800s. He's the brother of Antaro Umala, now serving a 25-year prison sentence for kidnapping 17 cops for three days and killing four of them. Another brother is Professor Ulises Umala. Ollanta attended the French Peruvian school Franco Paraguano and later Colegio Cooperativa La Union as the Union Cooperative High School, established by part of the Peruvian Nikkei community, that's the Japanese community. He began his military career in 1982 when he entered the Chirios Military School. In that career, Ubala was involved, as we've seen, in two major Peruvian conflicts of the past 20 years. One, the battle against the Shining Path, and the 1995 Cenepa War with Ecuador. In 1992, Umala served in Tingo Maria, fighting the remnants of the Shining Path. And in 1995, he served in the Cenepa War on the border with Ecuador. Now, let's go back and take a look at this military uprising he led in October 2000. Um, it occurred in the town of Toquepala, and it was against specifically Alberto Fujimori on his last days as president due to multiple corruption scandals. The main reason given for the rebellion was the capture of Vladimiro Montesinos, former SIN intelligence chief who had fled Peru for asylum in Panama after being caught on video trying to bribe an opposition congressman. Of course, that is the major, major, major job of a cop in Peru, a secret policeman is uh, keeping people well paid, bribed, whatever you want to call it. As I say, I, I knew Montesino because he used to come out and visit some of us in Luria Gancho in the years I was there when he was just a young lawyer. In the meantime, he had worked his way up to being chief of uh, what, what used to be called the PIPS, but now it's called SIN, the National Intelligence Service. It used to be Peruvian Investigative Police. I'm giving you the English translations for these names. But at any rate, he had about 40 co uh, soldiers, and they, they uh, led the revolt against their senior army commander. Montesinos later claimed that the uprising facilitated his concurrent escape, which may have happened if it did. I think it was just uh, the fact that he had to get the hell out of town anyway, so this was a good excuse. Many of Umala's men deserted him, leaving him only seven soldiers during the course of this revolt. And during the revolt, Umala called Peruvian patriots to join him in the rebellion, and about 300 former soldiers led by his brother Antaro answered his call and reported to have been in convoy attempting to join him when uh, <coughs> the government managed to suppress the revolt in that town. Well, at any rate, the revolt gained some sympathy from the Peruvian people uh, with the influential opposition newspaper La Republica calling him valiant and decisive, unlike most in Peru. In other words, they were encouraging him in what he tried to do. The newspaper also had many letters sent in by readers with accolades to Ollanta and his men. In the aftermath, the Peruvian army sent hundreds of soldiers to capture the rebels, and even so, Mal and his men managed to hide until President Fujimori was impeached from office a few days after this revolt, and Valentin Paniagua named interim president. Umala was then pardoned by Congress and allowed to return to military duty. I used to say that if a politician hadn't done some time in jail, he wasn't qualified to become a, a president or even a senator in Lima. He was sent as military attaché to Paris, then to Seoul, until December 2004 when he was forcibly retired. <coughs> His forced retirement is suspected to have part, partly motivated they, by the Etmo Casarista rebellion of Andrew Wilas, led by his brother Antaro Humala in January of 2005. 
And in the meantime, he received his master's degrees in political science from the Pontifical University, Catholic University of Peru in 2002. Well, now, back to the 2006 presidential campaign. He created the Peruvian Nationalist Party in October 2005, and he ran for president in 2006 with the support of the Union for Peru Party, <coughs> and eventually he had to be on their ticket because his uh, Nationalist Party didn't get registered in time. Ambassador Javier Perez de Cuellar, the former Peruvian Secretary General of the United Nations and founder of the UPP, that is the Union for Peru Party that he ran on, told the press on December 5, 2005 that he did not support the election of Umala as the party's presidential candidate, but there wasn't anything he could do about the fact that his party wanted to uh, put Umala on their ticket. There were some accusations that he concurred, that is, that the Umala concurred under the, uh, with torture under the war name Capitan Carlos while he was the commander of a military base in the jungle region of Madre Mia from 92 to 93, which may well have been the case. I mean, there isn't a soldier in Peru or cop that doesn't assume that torture is part of his duty of uh, prisoners we're talking about. His brother, Antaro Umala, stated in 2006, however, that Ollante Umala had used a name, this same name, during their various activities, but that he wasn't the only one that used that name. Um, in an interview with Jorge Ramos, he said that many people used the pseudonym Captain Carlos when they were in the process of torturing people, and that uh, other soldiers had used that name, and he said that uh, Oyanti Mala was not one of them. At any rate, however that may be, it's kind of irrelevant. On March 17th of 2006, Umala's campaign came under some controversy as his father, Isaac Umala, said, if I was president, I would grant amnesty to Abomayo Guzman and the other incarcerated members of Sendero Luminoso, Shining Path. That's Communist Party of Peru, Shining Path of Carlos Mariategui. Uh, Sendero Luminoso de Carlos Mariategui. He made other similar statements about amnesty for Victor Polay, the leader of the Tubac Amaro Revolutionary Movement, and other leaders of MRTA, <coughs> whereas the Shining Path was clearly moused and Chinese supported. The uh, Cubans preferred this uh, Tupac Amaro Revolutionary Movement by, led by Victor Polay, but at any rate, they were all in jail. So, Oyanti Umala distanced himself from the more radical members of his family during his campaign for president. And Umala's mother, meanwhile, made a statement on the March 21st of uh, that year, calling 2006, calling for homosexuals to be shot. <laughs> Oyanti Umala's older brother, Ulises Umala, ran against him in the election, but was considered a minor candidate and came in 14th in that 2006 election. And as you've seen, uh, Umala lost that particular one. And I have a little section here about my time with Vladimiro Montesinos, but I don't think I'm going to bother you with that today. If you're interested, it's all in your book. And uh, when you get your textbook, and, and especially next year when you have this particular chapter in there, or you can go and read my uh, volumes 3, 4, and 5 of that series, Idaho Smith's Search for the Foundation which uh, deal with my time in Peru, including the last two, four, and five, my time in that Peruvian prison. Uh, that's not what this lecture is about, so I'm just going to leave that subject right there. Um, at any rate, during the course of the campaign, Ubala responded to charges by Montesinos of his being in collaboration with Garcia's Aprista party with an intention to undermine his candidacy. Umala stated, I want to declare my indignation at the statements and went on to say, who benefits from the de declarations to stay in the honor of Oyate Umala? Evidently, they benefit Alan Garcia, which is, Garcia is one of the most corrupt politicians. If there is such a thing, that's a broad spectrum of corruption. Uh, Garcia from the opera, APRA, where he's got to be the most, probably on the farthest to the right. In another message that Montesino released to the media through his lawyer, he claimed that Umala was a political pawn of Cuban President Fidel Castro 
and Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez in an asymmetric war against the USA. Montesinos went on to state that Umala is not a new ideologist or political reformer, but an instrument. He means an instrument of these communists. Well, nobody would say that today, <laughs> but at any rate, that was then. On May 24, 2006, Umala warned of possible voter fraud in the upcoming second round of elections. We don't have to go back over that again, but um, that's the one that he, that he lost. All right. Now, <coughs> on June 12, 2006, Carlos Torres Caro, Umala's vice presidential running mate and elected congressman for the Union for Peru, the UPP party, stated that a faction of the UPP would split off from the party after disagreements with Umala to create what Torres called a constructive opposition. The split came after Obama called on leftist parties to form an alliance with the UPP to become the principal opposition party in Congress. Obama had met with representatives of the Communist Party of Peru Red Fatherland, that uh, is the party that his father founded, and the New Left Movement. Obama stated that the opposition would work to make sure Garcia complies with his electoral promises and again stated that he would not boycott Garcia's inauguration in July 2006. <coughs> On August 16, 2006, prosecutors in Peru filed charges against Amala for alleging human rights abuses including forced disappearance, torture and murder against Shining Path guerrillas during his service in San Martin, another department. Amala responded by denying the charges and stated that he was a victim of political persecution. He said the charges were orchestrated by Alan Garcia's administration to neutralize any alternative to Garcia's power. Okay, now let's get up to the 2011 elections when Omala ran again in the Peruvian general election on April 10, 2011 with Marisol Espinosa, his candidate for vice president. On May 19th at National University of San Marcos, and with the support of many Peruvian intellectuals and artists, including Mario Vargas Llosa, with Llosa had some, or Vargas Llosa had some reservations, Ollanta Umala signed the Compromiso in Defensa de la Democracy. Uh, democracia. Um, he campaigned as a center-left leader with the desire to help to create a more equitable framework for distributing the wealth from the country's key natural resources with the goal of maintaining foreign investment and economic growth in the country while working to improve the conditions of an impoverished majority. Now, going into the June 5th runoff election, he was in a statistical tie with Kiko Fujimori, but he won with 51.5% of the vote, becoming Peru's 94th president. After the news of the election of Ollanta as president of the Lima Stock, the Lima Stock Exchange went straight to hell. Umala's cabinet appointees, who were judged to be modern and in line with continuity, however, began to make the thing calm down a little bit. He was also said to have inherited a ticking time bomb of disputes <coughs> stemming in large part excuse me, from objections by indigenous groups to the damage to water supplies, crops, hunting grounds, brought by mining, logging, and oil and gas extraction from Alan Garcia, though he promised the poor and disenfranchised Peruvians a bigger stake in the rapidly growing national economy. His mandate for change was seen as a mandate for moderate change, with his orthodox cabinet appointees and his public oath on the Bible to respect investor rights, rule of law, and the Constitution, so he was sworn in on 20th of July 2011. Part of his social inclusion rhetoric during the campaign um, was that his government was led by Prime Minister Salomon Lerner Ethis, who would establish the Ministry of Development and Social Inclusion in order to coordinate the efficacy of his social program. Ollanta expressed sympathy for the former government of Juan Velasco, who of course was extremely popular with the poor and dispossessed of the country especially among the Indians and the Andes. 
You will recall from our previous lectures from Peru that Colonel Velasco took power in a bloodless military coup on o October 3, 1968. Subsequently, he had, had, had nationalized various industries and allied with Cuba and the Soviet Union. During his presidential candidacy in 2006 and his run for the presidency in 2011, Umala was closely affiliated with other pig-tied leaders in Latin America in general, South America in particular. Before taking office in 2011, he toured several countries in the Americas where he notably expressed the idea of <coughs> reuniting the Peruvian-Bolivian Confederation. He also visited Brazil, Colombia, Regolandia, and Venezuela. Okay, now, let's go back to Miss Acuna de Chape, who withstood all of these beatings and violent attempts to evict her, and so on and so forth, for over three years. She fought the U.S.-based multinational corporation, Newmont Mining, and <coughs> she took a really hard time. She got beat up many times, and all kinds of stuff happened to her. I won't bother going through the list of them. They're in your book. On February 19th, however, as we've seen, she finally won a case in Peru and um, where the judge struck down the lawsuit levied by Newmont's Yanacocha mine that had sought to expel her and her family for invading their land, which was really her land, but now they, Newmont had said it was, and there was theirs. They lost the case and they decided to get the hell out of Peru. Uh, so that is that, as far as that goes. But what really happened is she, she and her followers had managed to stop the Newmont Company from fully from developing their mining project for years. <coughs> and <clears throat> they got fed up with it. They wanted to get the hell out of there. The CIA was at first against them leaving, but then decided that it, if they want to go, let them go. What we have to do now is to test this project we've had. They have spent billions of dollars on this language school project of training Quechuan speaking agents. So they said, well, let's send them in there and see if we can't stop the Chinese mine owned by MMG, a uh, Chinese corporation, which is what they're busy trying to do at, the, at this moment. There are real dangers in facing off against a U.S. mining giant, as you might imagine. One day after uh, she had started, her home was shut up. But at any rate, to make a long story short, she won the Goldman Prize uh, and told Telesur that the Atacocha Mining Company was holding her family prisoner in their home, limiting their freedom of movement and constantly intimidating them. Foreign mining companies in Peru, by the way, are taxed at only 1.55% of their profits. You can be sure that Newmont's not happy about having to give up on the whole thing, but they couldn't see that they were going anywhere, and when they lost the CIA support for reasons which were probably unclear to them, they just said, we're gone. Well, she went on, and I've got a lot of what she had to say here in the book, but I'm not going to bother reading it all to you. The essence of it is always the same. She won this environmental prize for stopping mining giant Newmont from building their open pit gold mine that threatened to contaminate the water supply and cause shortages for thousands of people living in this agriculture, agricultural and cattle growing region. They say I'm a liar and they say I'm an invader and that I did not deserve the award because I invaded the mining firm's property, she told Telesur. Uh, and by I'm only defending my rights. Acuna was one of the few campesinos who had refused to sell her land in 2011 in the northern region of Cajamarca. As Yanacocha was setting up the largest gold mining project in South America, Minas Cunga, the International Finance Corporation, the lending arm of the World Bank, owns a 5% stake in the project. She is still fighting in courts, court for the property rights of her piece of land, but as you can see, um, Newmont, we don't need to go over that again, they finally threw in the towel. Acuna recalled the daily fear that she and others were forced to live in. 
excuse me. They beat us up, they kill us, they file complaints. Some of our comrades have been sentenced to prison for 20 or 30 years, she said, accusing the state of participating in the criminalization of their struggle. And still these people persisted. And it was their persistence in the long run which allowed them to win that case. The fact that the CIA decided to throw in the towel along with Numa and that they had their own reasons for doing that, that is, they want to use their, catch what speaking, thousands of agents they spent a billion dollars on to uh, try and cause trouble for the Chinese MMG mining company. Well, on March 3rd, Berta Caceres, one of last year's winners of this same Goldman Environmental Prize, was assassinated at her home in La Esperanza, Honduras. Latin America is the most dangerous place in the world for environmental activists. Why is that? Well, it's because the CIA kills them. Uh, they either use their own hitters or they uh, use some of those from the various fascist organizations which are dying in Latin America all over. Still, except for Cuba, of course. In Peru alone, 61 activists were killed in the past 10 years, according to human rights organization Global Witness. Behind all of this is the Gringo Death Star, now located in Lima's luxury barrio. This is the home of the CIA's command for South America, as I've already mentioned. Nevertheless, Acuna sent a message of encouragement to the Capacino leaders of the world, saying the award will help demonstrate that it is still possible to defend our rights. I want to make an example for the world, she concluded, inviting journalists to report the abuses she described. What we value, the land, the water, the nature that God gave us, the mining company destroys all that, she said. Okay, so what comes out of this last election? Peru Frente Amplio. <coughs> well, two right-wing candidates vie for the presidency right now. Many Peruvians are concerned that the future of human rights in Peru are at stake. The left-wing coalition Frente Amplio has re-emerged in Peru after 30 years, becoming the second largest bloc in Congress. But they did not make it to the second round of the presidential elections. The presidency will be contested between right-wing candidates Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, called PPK in Peru, and Keiko Fujimori. Under these circumstances, Frente Aplio made an ambiguous announcement claiming they will support the efforts of the coalition of social movements to oppose Fujimori, but they will not side with Kuczynski. Meanwhile, each presidential candidate is making public statements criticizing the other. That's going on right now, getting ready for the second round of elections. Kuczynski, also known by his initials PPK, has opted to avoid movement to the left to attract votes in Frente Amplio and the centrist party, Acción Popular. Instead, he is reminding people of the dictatorial and corrupt past of Fujimorismo. PPK claims Wednesday that the recent disagreement between Kiko Fujimori and her brother Kenji Fujimori shows how they think of Peru as their piñata. <coughs> he also stated that with Fujimorismo, the country is heading toward confrontations and authoritarianism. Kiko is instead moving toward the left by criticizing large mining projects responsible for social conflicts in the country. Of course, she's pretty safe on Manumont because they're le they left. But MMG, what she's really going after is the Chinese company, MMG. She also called Kuczynski a candidate of large businesses. She suggested she would renegotiate gas deals with transnational corporations to benefit Peruvians. She said there are ulterior motives for PPK's visit to the United States. PPK was, by the way, a U.S. citizen, but he says he renounced his nationality before this campaign began. <laughs> oh well, all of this gets to be so absurdly ridiculous after a while. Nevertheless, Kuczynski and Fujimori have pledged to continue with the neoliberal economic model imposed by Kegel's father, Alberto Fujimori, since 1990. In fact, after he failed to proceed to the second round of presidential elections in 2011, Kuczynski supported Kiko's campaign against current President Ollanta Humala. At a public rally, he called Alberto Fujimori's the best president 
a country he never had. So he's changed his mind a little bit since then. His statement was followed by supportive chants from Fujimori's followers that called him P.P. Keiko. <coughs> At any rate, Kuzinski's statements have come back to hurt him since he needs the anti-Fujimori vote to win. Polls show that close to 50% of Peruvians claim they will not vote for Kiko Fujimori under any circumstances, causing one analyst to claim that anti-Fujimorismo is the largest source of political capital. Transparency International ranked Alberto Fujimori as the seventh most corrupt leader in modern world history, <laughs> which is saying quite a bit. He is also serving a 25-year sentence in prison for crimes against humanity and several corruption cases and others' trials await him. Well, I guess le leading the spot would be, uh, leading that list would be our Ukrainian friends. And uh, Yats just had to leave the country. I guess that's quite a slap in the face to Mrs. Kaplan. I mean, whatever name she's using. At any rate, Veronica Mendoza, the presidential candidate of Fante Amplio, did not make it to the second round, but after an internal debate has continued, leading the party to oppose Fujimorismo. Now, she's the one that came in third and is head of this left United Left Front. Mendoza said that the party would not endorse Kuzinski under any condition because from a pra pragmatic viewpoint, for example, in economic aspects, there are no differences between them. Mendoza also stated that they will not, under any circumstances, to come to an agreement with those right-wing forces, and they will be the opposition to any of the governments, whether it's Fujimori or PPK. However, Mendoza had also claimed that the worst that can happen to the country is a return to Fujimorismo. <coughs> the tacit <coughs> conclusion of the statements by Frente Amplio that the left will not campaign in favor of Kuczynski, but they will campaign against Fujimori. In line with that direction, Mendoza held a press conference last Wednesday with the coalition No to Kiko, where she said Frente Amplio and this part of the campaign were going to actively participate because we do not forget. We do not forget the thousands of women victims of forced sterilizations we do not forget our social and labor leaders assassinated by Fujimori's dictatorship. We also don't forget the billions stolen from the Peruvian people, as they have asked us and reminded us today, for our memory, for justice, dignity, peace, and democracy. Frente Amplio joins the calling of the coalition No to Kiko and sees, says Fujimori never again. On May 1st, just a few days ago, um, Peruvians were reminded that Fujimorismo murdered labor union leaders, reduced workers' rights, and increased, increased employment, informa inform employment informality. That means without union organization. The group is also preparing for another massive national march on May 31st to follow up on the overall 50,000 strong demonstrations that took place on April 5th. <coughs> I, let me just stop and say, I, I noticed a few minutes ago when I was looking at Telesur, getting ready for this lecture, that uh, this is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. In Mexico, that's a big holiday. In the United States, it's a big holiday because the biggest concentration of Mexicans in the world is in Los Angeles. And, uh, of course, that's a <laughs> So that Cinco de Mayo is a real important holiday there. Now, I have talked to you about what this is all about, what that battle is all about in previous lectures and, of course, in the book. But I'll just remind you real quickly. The French government of Napoleon III took advantage of the opportunity they saw uh, when the U.S. was preparing to go into the, its own civil war and invaded Mexico. Of course, they didn't have any trouble. They had 5,000 or 7,000 troops, they said, didn't have any trouble pushing the government out of Mexico City. Uh, but, but what happened is that that government then retreated to the state of Pueblo. Now, Abraham Lincoln was extremely pissed off about this, realized what was going on. And he wanted the 
he told the War Department and his general staff to get ready to invade Mexico and kick the French in the ass. But they decided, they told him, look, let's take care of the South first and then we can wrap up the frogs with no problem whatsoever as soon as that's over with. And he said, oh shit, I guess if, that's, if you insist on it, then we'll just have to wait. Now, so the Mexicans that were loyal to their country retreated to um, the state of Pueblo and there they set up a trap for the French army and they whipped their ass. Um, something that hardly anybody could believe. Now, the, the War Department in Washington had sent them what it could in the war in terms of help, but fundamentally they won that fight by themselves. Well, the French government was shocked. They sent another 30,000 troops, French troops, into Mexico, and of course they pretty well solidified their rule, but they never conquered the Saragossa bunch of uh, Mexicans who had defeated them. And these guys just, they kept returning, they kept, I mean, they kept retreating, they kept ret uh, getting into mountains where the French couldn't get at them. And uh, when, as soon as the war was over, <laughs> Lincoln sent all the help they could possibly need, and they ran the French out of uh, the United, uh, out of Mexico once and for all. All right, so that's what Cinco de Mayo means. It's not Mexican Independence Day. That's in September. These are holidays I got to know very well when I was running NL oper field operations and oil field service down there because one of the major reasons we were there is that for every big holiday like Christmas or Independence Day or Cinco de Mayo, uh, Pemex, the state oil company, couldn't field crews to uh, take care of their wells, uh, which is important because wells have to run 24 hours a day and they have to be maintained 24 hours a day. So they brought us down there for that purpose, and uh, we were there along with Schlumberger and Halliburton, and um, we were doing our part, which was pipe recovery, which is something that has to be done immediately when you get stuck drilling a well. But at any rate, the Mex <laughs> Mexicans would be so drunk, they'd be out on the freeway firing rockets at our, at our trucks as we tried to get up to the oil field. So that was the kind of thing that you'd have to run into from time to time. Well, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Now, at this upcoming Congress, the Frente Amplio, the left-wing coalition, um, has 20 seats. It's led by Veronica Mendoza, who's only 35 years old. She's a psychologist by education, a socialist by avocation, and she belongs to the Frente Amplio party. She has served in Congress since 2011. With that number of congressmen, uh, the second force in that 73 outfit will be uh, Kuki Fuji, should be second to Kuki Fujimori's uh, force. Um, now, in Spanish, they call what Fujimori did a auto coup or auto golpe. Golpe literally means blow, but it's the term they use for coup. He was carried out April 5, 1992, supported by the armed forces. It temporarily dissolved the parliament. Now, the third course a party will be Kuczynski's party, which will have 18 seats. So her party will be first, uh, I mean second, to uh, Kiko's party, regardless of who wins this election. And the third party will be Kuczynski's, PPK's party, now calls itself Alianza por Progreso, the Alliance for Progress. The third force will is will have 18 seats in this thing. But, you know, PPK is 77 years old. <coughs> so, this is a factor that people have to take in. If he wins the election, there's no guarantee that he will serve out five years. So, whoever he's going to run with as vice president is going to be important. At any rate, in the past, he's been Minister of Energy in Malahundi's government. You will recall that he was president from 80 to 85. Before that, he was president that was overthrown by um, uh, uh, Colonel Velasco. PPK was Minister of Energy in that government, Minister of Finance, Prime Minister under, under Alejandro Toledo, who was uh, president from 2001-2006. 
Kuczynski is widely accused of large-scale corruption, mainly in dealings with Hunt Oil. Hunt Brothers from Texas. You, some of you may know those terms. Know, know a little bit about the history of that bunch. Never a more corrupt bunch in the oil business than the Hunt Brothers, and that's saying a lot, since the oil field in the U.S. is totally corrupt, too. But at any rate, um, he fled Peru in the trunk of a car for Ecuador, where he then went to the United States. And in the U.S., he was awarded a plum job with the World Bank, and that's how he sat out the last few years. He has 12 seats and is followed by a right-wing labor faker opera that has by now been so exposed that it was only able to get five seats together. Two additional candidates who might have been competitive in this last election were Julio Guzman, an economist who never served in public office, and Cesar Acuna, a self-styled entrepreneur who represented the Department of La Libertad in Congress from 2000 to 2006. And right now, he's the one that PPK is trying to ally with to get enough votes to beat Miss Fujimori. However, none of these guys have a clean record. Both of these two were expelled from running by the Election Commission just a month before the election for registration irregularities, the other for corruption. Obviously not the same criteria were applied to all candidates. If not other than Veronica, none of them would remain in the race. In other words, if, if the person were being chosen on the basis of not having any criminal actions filed against him, she's the only one who would have qualified. The opposition of Miss Fujimori immediately launched a series of legal measures to get her exposed too, but they didn't get there in time to pray the judges, so she was on the ballot. Um, the guys are getting uh, <coughs> harder to bribe because they want more money. It used to be you could bribe any Supreme Court judge in Peru for $6,000. That was back in my day. <coughs> back when Harry Schlotterman was a CIA agent, career agent inside the State Department, was ambassador to Peru. Now there's another career agent named Brian Nichols, another CIA career man who's putting in his last tour of duty in Peru. Um, and then he'll go off and retire and have some kind of plum job with the World Bank, I suppose. At any rate, imagine a country that in the last four decades has been governed successively by thieves. A country that every five years goes through the same circus of having to elect a president as the lesser evil, already knowing that whoever is elected will continue robbing their nation. Peru is a country that arguably can be considered the richest in natural resources per capita of all of Latin America, <coughs> where the people at large have hardly benefited at all from the exploitation of the mostly unrenewable resources. On the contrary, the population has grown poor. The gap between rich and poor has grown wider over the past 30 years. Peru is a country that boasted an average annual growth rate of 5 to 7 percent in the first 10 years of the 20th first century. Uh, that is from 2001 to 2010. Confirmed by the Masters excuse me, of International Finance, the World Bank, and the IMF, a growth rate of which 80% went to 5% of the population, again widening the divide between the haves and have-nots, increasing unemployment and delinquency. The country is controlled now via five families, which also control and manipulate 90% of the news. You recall in my first lectures on modern Peru, there were 12 families running the country. Well, those have shrunk by marriage mainly into five families. The people have been subjected to a neoliberal reign for at least the last 25 years, and Peru is now firmly in the grip of the USA, as I get, as I pointed out, again the subject of a rule by a U.S. ambassador who is the head, de facto head of the U.S. Vice Royalty for Peru, who, Brian Nichols, who is a career CIA agent. In all of this, we should not forget the empire's semi-clandestine dirty fingers at every election of the globe. Peru is no exception. A country rich in mineral resources and hydrocarbons is already run by a liberal, neoliberal regime, subservient to empire, the empire. Gringolandia's influence is becoming increasingly sophisticated, including infiltration of NED, National Endowment for Doc Democracy, trained groups, or other NGOs to stir, stir social unrest, 
help spread lies and false propaganda by corporate-controlled so-called free media, although the social media, a la Arab Spring, and the different color revolutions have uh, not yet been successful. Ollanta Umala was thoroughly vetted by Washington's analysts for his steadfastness and commitment to their cause, much like Obama was in 2008 before he was made president. Umala qualified as he accepted a number of rules, including keeping Toledo's neoliberal Minister of Finance, so that after just four months in office in 2011, as we've seen, some of his former ministers say he was given by orders by Washington to dismiss his cabinet and follow the neoliberal extractive industry course of his predecessor. Plus, listen carefully from now on to what Washington has to say, or else. Or else always means they'll kill you. Thus, Humala, the first nominally socialist president after the Juan Velasco Alvarado, left-wing military dictatorship, 68 to 75, dismissed his left-leaning cabinet consisting of highly intellectual and transparent politicians and replaced them with a group of shady neoliberals. The so-called Peru Profundo, meaning rural Peru, where poverty today is still rampant. The people who voted for him felt and still feel betrayed. Their hope now is in Veronica Mendes, a strong, although with reasonable doubts from past experience with the left. However, they have nothing to lose. But would the USA tolerate a left-wing president in Peru? Or for that matter, anywhere in the world? Look at what happened in Greece with Alexis Tsipras. Or in Honduras with Manuel Zelaya. Or in Brazil right now, being smothered by the USA um, who wants to get rid desperately of Dilma Rousseff. And in Argentina where they managed to squeak through this sleazy guy Daniel Scioli. I mean, uh, Macri, I'm sorry, who was running against Daniel Scioli. Argentina being outmaneuvered by the long arm of the U.S. in favor of ultra-neoliberal Mauricio Macri, and the list goes on. Of course, every one of these countries is contesting this struggle, and uh, I have no reason to believe that the gringos will be successful there. Uh, although, as usual, they'll cause a lot of trouble, just like they have in Iraq and uh, Syria, Ukraine, and so on. That is where the potential for a military coup comes in. People have reached a boiling point. It takes a long time for Peruvians to lose their temper and go to the barricades, comparatively speaking, but looking at people's revolutions in Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuelans, Venezuela, Peruvians are complacent, but now their discontent is running high. A former army general told me several weeks ago that people are unhappy, that they despise this electoral process, there are rumors they may take to the streets in masses not seen for a long time, and such demonstrations have recently taken place against Kiko Fujimori, as they did on the 5th of April, just a month ago, because of her father's internal coup, where reportedly between 150,000 and 200,000 people took to the streets. A polarized public might no longer tolerate fraud, betrayal, and corruption by the mighty, in which case the military might support the people, says this ex-general. Well, we'll just have to wait and see, but at any rate, the army divided. There are those who want to Peru not just for a few, but who have an interest in whatever, building of their land that can be achieved into a viable, sustainable, equitable, and socially progressive country for all of the people. These few elitists want to continue pillaging and selling Peru to foreign corporations for the, and for their own benefit, leaving the vast majority of the people in poverty, many in abject poverty, promoting the, a country of extractive exports, destroying the environment and the social fabric of the population, and they have no interest in building a manufacturing base which would add economic value in Peru and create decent jobs. Narco Peru. Peru's Congress elect includes people linked to drug trafficking, according to an investigation by drug trafficking expert Jaime Antesana. Twenty-one candidates who won a seat in Congress on April 10th have ties or are part of drug trafficking cartels, and he warns that Peru could be turned into a narco state. Well, I think he's uh, trying to protect himself there to a degree. Peru's always been a narco state ever since I've been 
had anything to do with it. Um, I had to laugh the other day when I saw that Bill O'Reilly was interviewing Vicente Fox uh, about how to fight drug trafficking in Mexico. Now, I know Bill prides himself on being completely ignorant of world affairs, but everybody in Mexico knows, and I think every Spanish speaker in the United States, that Vicente Fox was the first of the three great drug presidents. First thing he did, first week he was president, he let El Chapo out of jail. Oh, well, at any rate. Same thing's true in Peru. There aren't any politicians down there, except perhaps for Miss Mendoza's party, that aren't uh, uh, totally involved in the drug business. There aren't any capitalists in Peru that aren't totally involved in the drug business. That's the nature of it. If you've been watching these lectures, reading these chapters, you already know all about that. That's just the way it goes. Well, at any rate, Antenzana has been studying drug trafficking in, in Peru for 18 years. And he says that this incoming Congress will be just like the others, facilitating drug trafficking, and uh, all of these guys are going to be cartel members. At the moment, Antezana refrains from naming people to avoid lawsuits and bullets, I would assume, but he does provide details about each case. One on his list is the congressman-elect from Ayacucho. Antezana alleges that this person owns a pit on his property where they mix coca leaves with chemicals to produce cocaine that helped him fund his campaign. Well, everybody in the Andes has a pit lined with plastic that they fill up with uh, with coca leaves, pour kerosene over it, or it used to be, of course, that you'd like to use acetone or something, but now that that's a controlled substance, you could use kerosene. I mean, this whole process is dirt cheap. You get one of those pits out of there, you, you get a, a few hundred uh, kilos of pasta basica, which you can always sell to smoke or clean it up a little bit, make pasta lavada, or clean it up a little more, make cocaina, hydrococaine uh, hydroco hydrochlorate, um, at any rate. So th these things are not, nothing's, not, nothing this guy says would surprise anybody in Peru. Well, out of the 21 Narco Congress members, as Antizana calls them, 14 are from the political party Forza Popular, led by Keiko Fujimori and founded by her father, former president turned dictator Alberto Fujimori. And as you know, her father is serving a sentence for crimes against humanity and corruption and deals that include drug cartels. Those 21 Congress members are mostly from areas far from large cities. One of the cases is from Ancash, which has a Fuerzo Popular narco congressman whose father was detained with drugs and as the son he continued with the business, says Antezano. The electoral system mandates that the parties provide an accounting of their electrical camp uh, campaign expenses and finances. However, experts claim there are no mechanisms to follow up or verify those accounting submissions. So, I guess you're right. You write up any kind of account you want, give it to them, that's it. Even when hefty campaign expenses are obvious, Alvaro Campana, for instance, from the NGO Propuesta Ciudadana, argues that first there should be regulations that make it possible in politics um, and the electoral process to not be turned into money laundering methods. And secondly, he says the rules should allow us to have more control of who is interested in do donating to the campaign. Currently, no law requires an electoral campaign to show who are the donors. Duly elected members of the opposition party, Frente Amplio, like Manuel Damert, claim they will insist on legal ways to battle the infiltration of drug trafficking into politics. And I can assure you that if anybody gets actually gets in, in a position of bringing a danger, they will be immediately murdered. We propose confronting all the symptoms and links with drug trafficking in a clear and explicit manner because sometimes there are claims against drug trafficking and they stay without much investigation or they are internally investigated but no sanctions are made, said Mr. Dammert. We also have to separate those public officers who have to confront drug trafficking and don't do it. <laughs> I guess all of this should be kind of common sense, but at any rate, you've got the picture, I think. For Antezana, a potential Fujimori government will likely mean a move toward becoming a narco state, <laughs> as if it wasn't already and hasn't been for many decades. Um, well, 
I have no idea who's going to come out on top of that PPK Fujimori contest. And as you see, it doesn't really matter. They're both neoliberals, so they're both completely under the control of the U.S. State Department. Nobody is going to threaten the Death Star out there. Um, so, you know, Peru is in a frozen state for the time being. And the only thing I can see there that's going to do any good would be to revive the guerrilla war. Because the only place in Latin America that's been permanently secure against gringo imperialism is Cuba. And that's because the Cubans fought their way to power, created their own army, and um, did it the way Fidel did it. I mean, the example is clear. If you don't do it that way, if you let the capitalists retain their property and some kind of legal status, as have happened in the rest of these South American countries from Venezuela to Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, um, and Bolivia, well, eventually they'll figure out some way to get back in. So, at any rate, that's, uh, that's what we have today, May 5th, single day mile, uh, in the year 2016, as we wait for these last two candidates to win, decide what's going to happen in Peru. In the next lecture, we're going to move on to the most important country in South America right now, which is Brazil, and where uh, it's setting up for a civil war. Part of the ruling class is supporting uh, Miss Rousseff, and part of it is against them, against her. The CIA, of course, has thrown in its uh, everything it's got to try to get rid of her. And uh, I'm not going to make any predictions there about what's going to happen because it could go either way, um, depending on many different factors. But that will be our, our subject for lecture number 43, The Empire Strikes Back Against Brazil. And for that, let me say, uh, go out and have a good time on the Cinco de Mayo, and we'll see you not too long in the future.